And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Aaron Robbins from Ontario, Canada, who during his near-death experience met God, which we're going to learn about and more. Aaron, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate this opportunity and uh, appreciate your time on this. Well, we're happy to have you. And before you get into your NDE, I think you need to give us a little backstory to kind of set it up. I was uh, actually a mountain bike racer earlier. So I'm just, and uh, dying at the age that I was, was very surprising to me. I was very in shape. Um, I was racing mountain bikes in BC, doing five, six hour races. I had a team and uh, very, very good shape. And uh, I guess 11 years later, um, I decided to take a trip to uh, Cuba. Uh, with, it was going to be a father-daughter trip. And uh, my oldest daughter, she was just going to be entering into university. It was a perfect time just to kind of get away before that next chapter of her life uh, was starting. And um, it was February of uh, 2018 that uh, we decided to uh, get to sunnier weather. It was pretty cold up here in February, and uh, a lot of snowbirds like to go down south. So, um, yeah, it was a father-daughter trip, and we took off to the sunny beaches of Cuba. Um, my wife stayed home with our dog, and she was starting a new job and, you know, couldn't make the trip. But, um, you know, I was up to the task. So, uh, down in Cuba, got down there, and to break up the week a little bit, uh, decided to book an excursion. Uh, trying to see the countryside a little bit, uh, get out into the public, away from the resort. So uh, halfway through the trip, we booked a Jeep safari excursion, which headed into inland into the mountainous range, ranges of Cuba, and then uh, ride some horses, off-roading in some Jeeps, um, lunch in a town called Moran, and... Uh, boats through mangrove forests and back home. Sounded perfect. And we're really looking forward to it. Um, it was going to be a Friday. And I guess it, I got a bit of a pre-warning of some health issues when I was down there. Um, the Thursday before the excursion, uh, we took for a nice long walk on the beach. And beautiful day, warm breeze, you know, crystal clear water, turquoise water, and uh, went for a really nice long walk. And we like to go for walks and hikes and everything. Um, but I was feeling kind of tired, um, which is unusual. I usually have a lot of energy. Um, and I thought, well, maybe we should turn around. We're kind of getting far. And uh, I was feeling exhausted. Uh, my girls, they kind of took off and were adventuring and having fun in the sand and looking at the crabs and everything. And we uh, just started back towards the resort and man, my legs just felt like lead and they were just so tired and, and I was really struggling and it was kind of windy, but you know, it was, it was unusual. And I felt a little nervous at the same time, like, why is this happening? And, and uh, I didn't know what was going on. I, it shouldn't have been that hard. I shouldn't not have been that tired and exhausted. And I just felt like I wanted to sit down and like I had to. Like I, and I was worried I wasn't going to get back to the resort without assistance. And um, I kind of called for my girls to come back to me. And by the time they got back and, you know, I kind of had regained myself a little bit. And I was able to make it back to the resort. But it, it kind of threw me for a little, a little bit of a loop. And... I stayed in the rest of the night because I knew we had this big excursion the next day and I didn't want it to be a fun, good, adventurous day. Um, I don't know what happened, but that was sort of a little pre-warning that something else was going on. Um, didn't know what. I might have been a little dehydrated. I wasn't sure. Um, next day, beautiful, gorgeous morning. We all got to... Uh, the Jeeps for the excursion, Jeep Safari, and we took off and made it to the mountains in a couple hours. And it was a fantastic day. We had so much fun. 
It was an amazing, amazing time. We saw, you know, butterflies and mangroves and swamps and off roads and and um, got to the mountains and we went horseback riding and it was just a really, really fantastic day. Um, everybody was having a lot of fun. Uh, we were getting kind of hungry at that point after the horseback ride. We we're running a little late. We had to do some stream crossings and cut some brush because some tropical storms came through earlier on the trail. So we're running a little bit late. Um, got back in the Jeeps in the mountains after the ranch and started heading toward the city of Moron, where we're going to be having lunch at a restaurant there that was uh, like an open air restaurant and first privately owned business. In a communist country, they were very proud of it. So we we're kind of looking forward to that. Um, heading back to Moran, driving quite fast because uh, to make up time. And just outside of the city, um, I started getting heart palpitations. And I've had heart palpitations uh, you know, before, but they just come and go within a matter of seconds. Just give a little cough. And, you know, I always had an irregular heartbeat. Um, but this one, um, they continued, it was, it was a palpitation that just continued like a vibration in my heart area. And I was driving and it was not normal, uh, by any means. And I got a little nervous because it was not going away and something was, you know, I felt something was wrong, not right. Uh, I said to my daughter, I said, look, you know, I think I'm having little anxiety or something and not feeling right and i was starting to sweat a little bit and my daughter in the front seat she said that's okay just you know keep an eye on it and i said well if i have to pull over that's why she said you know just do what you need to do and um put the air conditioner on and try to blast air try to drink water try to get cough try to get the you know palpitation out and um it just didn't just didn't go and i was my breathing started getting kind of a little bit laborious and you know that got brought on more anxiety and just before entering the city of moran i started getting tunnel vision and i knew that whatever was happening was progressing and i was driving so it was a little bit scary and i knew i had to pull over and we had just entered the city at this point and i was looking for a place to pull over because i knew it wasn't going well and i couldn't drive for much longer so i just there's people on the streets there was dogs and roosters running around and everything and i just i found a spot where i could pull over safely pulled the jeep over and took it out of gear and put it in neutral and reached down and at this point it, it, darkness was kind of coming in creeping in i was able just to hit that emergency the four-way emergency lights and that was a signal to the other people in the group that you know we're having an issue or mechanical or whatever and for the convoy there i think there was about eight or nine jeeps there and uh to stop and uh, they were having maybe the mechanical or whatever issue and uh I was just able to push that emergency button um, with four ways and boom, I was out. I was, I was in darkness, um, complete darkness. And uh, I don't remember a thing. Um, my family afterwards, my daughter said that I had stopped breathing. Um, I actually skin had caved in. And I turned blue, like purpley blue, and uh, my foot went down on the accelerator as well. And but luckily I was in neutral, so the car you know wasn't going anywhere. I was still rolling slightly under the momentum of me stopping, and my oldest daughter had to reach over and try to lift my heavy leg off the pedal, and um, she was. You know she had trouble with that like i and i was all slumped over as well and uh, my daughter in the back was slamming on the back window trying to get the attention of the other people and it's quite a quite a scene so i'm told i wasn't 
coherent or conscious at that point. But uh, because my skin collapsed, um, I got, obviously blood pressure dropped dramatically, and I do believe my heart probably stopped. Um, people came up to the Jeep to see what was going on. Uh, they opened the door. Um, I was still gone at that point. And um, my daughter asked, you know, check if he's breathing, check if he's breathing, and nobody could tell if I was or not. But then I came to, um, I was out for about a minute or so, and I was quite shaken, uh, but everything seemed to be, you know, better. I, I was conscious again. Um, and so I just thought, well, that was unusual. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Uh, somebody else asked if, they asked if I could drive, and I said, no, I don't feel like I could drive. Um, I did feel that my heart was still palpitating, though, too. So, you know, it hadn't corrected itself. And um, you know, in fact, it was arrhythmia that I was experiencing um, and not knowing that it was arrhythmia, which was more severe. And uh, so I, they said, you know, the tour guide was like, you want to go to a hospital? There's one nearby. nearby. Last thing I wanted to do was go to a Cuban hospital or foreign hospital. <laughs> um, not knowing what the conditions were like in the hospital or equipment and you know it's the last thing you want to do on a vacation when you're having the most fantastic day up to that point um stubborn me said no no let's go to the restaurant and maybe it will get better it will correct itself and i won't have to go to the hospital so anyway somebody else drove we weren't too far from the restaurant got to the restaurant went to the bathroom rush you know splash water in my face and, and try to cough it out. Heart was still palpitating, but I was functioning. I was conscious and, you know, aware, a little confused though, a um, little stressed and anxiety. Um, eventually, uh, my daughter got my wife on the phone back home and uh, she talked to me and talked me through it and said, look, how long has this been going on for? I looked at my watch and then at that point, but I talked to her, I said, oh, it's probably been about 40 minutes. She said, well, that's not normal. You know, you have to get it checked out. And um, I agreed. I said, yeah, it isn't normal. So um, I didn't want to interrupt everybody's lunch. So I just kind of sat there suffering and uh, hoping and praying that will go away. And it didn't. So I went up to the tour guy. I said, look, I'll take you up on the offer to take me to the hospital. And, I got to get it checked out. And um, so we left the hospital, um, got there, and I think they parked the furthest away from the front door as possible. And I had to walk around this huge hospital. <laughs> and uh, everybody was in a hurry. The tour guide and my two daughters were trying to get me into the hospital. And I was walking behind. And they didn't know what I was going through. And I was falling behind. I was having trouble walking. Uh, trouble getting breath as well. Um, it was like I was running a marathon type thing. Uh, eventually they looked back to check on me and I was way back there, like 50 yards back and they waited and eventually got around to the front doors of the hospital and there was no reception. There was no uh, kiosk, no, no nurses and didn't know what to do. But luckily, thankfully, our tour guide, she knew what to do and she went and got somebody um and she was somebody that ran the ekg um i guess uh system or whatever ekg monitor got me into this little room and uh got me hooked up with this ekg and took a reading and the lady didn't speak english and uh just spanish and i didn't know what you know what she was going to say so i just could try to look at her facial features to see what was, you know, what I could get from her. And she took a look at the reading and she just had this biggest frown on her face and worried look and kind of shook her head a little bit. Like, you know, it's, it's not right. This, this guy's kind of done. <laughs> and she showed it and explained what was going on to the tour guide and she got all panicky. And so I thought, okay, this isn't good. 
This is not looking good. They're not all like, oh, it's fine. Don't worry. You'll be good. We'll take care of you. It's more like, you know, this guy doesn't have any chance at all. And it's something to be really, really worried about. Uh, they said, um, tour guide said, we have to take you up to the foreigner wing. We have to get take you to examination room now, uh, right away. I'm like, okay, let's go. And um, got into a wheelchair. There was one that's sitting there waiting for me and got me up to the foreigner's uh, wing into the room and um, sat down on an examination bed. Um, the foreigner's wing was quite nice. It was uh, well appointed and clean and, you know, nurses had white uniforms and, you know, it was quite, you know, quite acceptable. Um, felt good at that point, a little bit better anyway. Um, when nurses came into the room, uh, I, was feel I was so nervous about what was going on. I was feeling quite upset to my stomach. Um, I had drank in a, like a bubbly pop uh, soda before, and I don't think it was staying there. So I actually threw up a couple times and I apologized because I didn't quite make it to the toilet to, to do it and uh, felt bad, but almost made it there. And the nurses were courteous. They're like, that's fine. That's fine. That's okay. And, um, sat there for a few minutes. Daughters were in the room. Tour guide was in the room. Nurses were in the room, but no doctors yet. After a few minutes, the doctors did show up, and there was two doctors. And one came over, and they started asking questions about what had happened. And I kind of ran him through what I was experiencing. And he said, "Are you experiencing the heart palpitation still?" I said, "Yes, I am." Um, that EKG, which I didn't know at the time, I was provided later. <clears throat> it actually showed a heart rate of 225 beats per minute. And I had been sustaining that for over an hour and a half. That was um, in the actual heart muscle had stopped. So, and the only thing pushing blood through were the ventricles opening and closing. The muscle part had actually stopped. So I was kind of literally the, the walking dead at that point. That's why they were so worried um, after the EKG. So the doctors came in, um, they knew, you know, they're very well trained down there. They knew what was going on. And uh, he said, okay, we have to examine you. So they took off my shoes and my ring and watch and all that kind of stuff and laid me back. Um, they ushered my doctor, my daughters and the tour guide and everybody out. So it was just two doctors and about four nurses in there and um, laid me back. And I said goodbye to them and they laid me back on the bed and one doctor went to the side of the bed and grabbed my wrist and was trying in my neck and in there trying to feel for a pulse and try to get a pulse. And uh, at that point, things started escalating um, after my family left the room. Um, my breathing became very, very shallow and uh, I wasn't getting the oxygen that I needed uh, as well. So I was like, gasping a little bit and it was, they did put oxygen on and the oxygen was blowing, you know, into my nose and, and that, but it didn't seem to help. Um, I was still starving of oxygen. I wasn't taking it in. Um, nurses and doctors were all around the examination bed. Um, a lot of pressure on my wrist, like looking for a pulse. And, and I was looking up and I was kind of getting a little scared because things had changed, drastically changed very quickly. Um, it's kind of discerning when you can't take a breath. <laughs> um, I was looking up at all these figures around, these doctors and nurses around my bed, and they started going blurry. And I started losing, you know, my my vision a little bit. They started going blurry. Their outlines and their facial features started going. And uh, I thought that was another progression and that made me a little bit more scared and stuff about what was going on. That hadn't happened before. And then the most incredible bright white light erupted, exploded in the room. And it was it was not a light from outside. Like their windows, um, it was from inside the room that the light emanated from. And it was from behind like at the foot of my head bed behind the nurses. So 
it just kind of exploded. This white light exploded in the room. And then I was completely blinded in white light. And I just, I couldn't see anything except white. I could, and then my, my feelings started going. Uh, so I started losing the feeling from my toes and my fingers and started losing the feeling I could feel going numb or like, you know, going up my legs and down my arms. And that pressure that the doctor had on my wrist where he's trying to find a pulse, you know, he was a big, he had really strong hands and, and, and stuff. And all of a sudden I couldn't feel his hand on my wrist anymore. And uh, I could, my chest from breathing, you know, I was trying to get air and gasping and my, my chest started to get more shallow and started slowing down. And then I couldn't feel my chest moving anymore. And so my breathing had stopped. And so everything was still. And last feeling I had, I'm just in white light. The last feeling I had, which was, was really strange, were bubbles in my mouth. I could feel bubbles and I was playing with them, thinking, oh, that's kind of weird. It's almost like when you blow bubbles in milk kind of thing. <laughs> and I was feeling them with my tongue and I thought it was kind of amusing. I thought, well, maybe that was acid reflux from the soda or something. I, I don't know. Um, but at that point, I was, I was pretty scared about the way things were, pro were progressing. I couldn't see. I was just in white light. Uh, I lost all the feeling in my body. I couldn't, I couldn't sense myself breathing anymore. Um, only thing I could do at that point was say the word Jesus. And I said Jesus three times. And I just kept saying, Jesus, Jesus. And that, the third Jesus, I didn't have any more breath in my lungs. I just, midway through his name, I just, I couldn't speak anymore. Um, my lungs were empty. I was, I was done at that point. But I was fully conscious and kind of at peace, a little, you know, didn't know what was going on. But my thoughts at that point, I couldn't see anything except this white space. I call it my soul space. It was calm. Um, it was like a big empty white room type thing. And I just thought, boy, I hope they're doing something to help me. I hope they're, you know, doing some kind of procedure or getting something to, to, to get my sight back and, and to help me. I, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And so I just thought, oh, I'm, I can't do anything. I'm just going to hang out here. So I was just kind of hanging out there wondering, okay, well, what's going to happen next? And this is where it got really, really weird. And I've never experienced this before. And um, it's hard to describe because time doesn't exist. And um, my consciousness split. Um, there was two timelines, two things happened at the same time. And I was in two places experiencing two different things at the same time. So I'll, I'll kind of go from one to the other. Um, first experience was that whiteness started to move and started to change hue, color from white to gold. It's like a golden color. And the room started to move and started moving kind of like, like clouds or in, around me. And next thing you know, I was in the midst of golden clouds all around me. And it was beautiful. And um, so that's one part that happened. And there's all, like, it continues after that. But I'll just go into the other part where my soul left my body. I got separated. And I felt, while I was in that white space, I felt also this pull this gravitational pull almost like if you're at the amusement park and you're know, tilt a whirl and you're you know you got that gravity pull back and i felt this pull and and i got pulled my soul got pulled out of my body and it was kind of humorous because it was quite the release is like it, it actually had a kind of a pop sound to it like a kind of when i finally let go my soul let go of my body and when that happened, I, you know, I shot out like a cannon. <laughs> like, 
um, you know, people say, I guess, you know, they float in the room and out of body experience and they can see the doctors and nurses around. That didn't happen with me, not at all. My soul was like, I'm out of here. <laughs> and I shot into outer space. I went right through the hospital up in the atmosphere and I was ended up above the earth. During that time of travel, um, I knew it was so different and so unusual. I knew and came to realization that I had died. Um, I did not feel I had a body anymore. I felt movement. I felt pull. I felt free. I, and, and I said all these kind of stars and, and colors were like shooting past me as I was going up into the atmosphere and that and all these bright lights and that. And um, it was so unusual and so different. And I was so conscious at that time that I knew I just came to realize it. I said to myself, wow, I just died. And then it's like, what next? <laughs> and what next is that I was above the earth. And I didn't feel alone. I felt something with me, I, you know, presence with me. I didn't feel scared, but I was looking down upon the earth. And very similar to Google Earth, where you can kind of zoom in. I was looking down the earth and I shot and zoomed in right beside my wife. And she was driving uh, at the time up a local street, uh, a route that we usually go to for shopping or whatever. And I ended up right beside her in the car and I could see her. And I just, at that point, felt that, you know what, she be okay she'll be upset and of course and and that but in the long run spiritually i think you know she'll be all right she, she'll be, she'll manage me not being here you know as hurtful as it is and you know i know she'd be upset but in the long run you know spiritually she would be all right and then i had a quick thought about my daughters i'm thinking well they might not be um anyway then i zoomed right back out to where i was above the earth Again. And I was floating there just for a few seconds looking at it, and um, it was beautiful. And then it shot away, the earth just shot away, like a marble being skipped down the road. It was just gone, like, like light speed. It was gone. And then I looped, my consciousness looped back into the golden clouds. So I was back together again. My consciousness had split. And then it met again back in the golden clouds from the first timeline. And then I was in golden clouds again. And I was just, you know, I had no body. Um, I didn't know how to look around. So I was just kind of stuck staring and kind of a little bit of a vision I could kind of see around. And, and behind these golden clouds, I didn't saw an entity there. Um, angelic, I guess, but it was not human. Uh, it was more like an energy, um, and it was behind and moving behind these clouds. Um, it was a ball of energy, like a swirling marble, and you could see an energy field, like a tear shaped, like this, with a ball in the middle, and it was spinning, and it was beautiful colors of uh, purple and red and actually mercury color too, like liquid mercury, all spinning around in this in this energy. And it was an entity, and it was moving, and all I could do was just think, I was like, wow, aren't you beautiful? Because it was beautiful, it was stunning. And it kind of went one direction, then it stopped, and then it went away, and it disappeared. But I never felt alone, and it, you know, um, at that point, the peace was so incredible. I realized the peace that I was in, the peace that I felt. And the peace, it's not something you can get here on Earth. Um, the peace was so incredible, it was almost euphoric. And here, when you experience euphoria, you know, it, it's kind of a fleeting moment. You get the high, then you get the low. There, the peace was so euphoric, you just stayed up on the high. Constant, constant feeling of peace and euphoria. And... You know, you say that, oh, I feel so peaceful. Well, no, this peace 
it actually has substance to it and a feeling like a radiance to it. And um, it was so incredible that it actually made me laugh and giggle. And the piece I can describe, you know, you, you don't have any work. You don't have any responsibilities. Uh, you don't have anything pressing, any meetings, anything, you know, nothing. Just absolute peaceful nothingness. And it actually made you giddy and made me giddy and laughing. And I was expecting that feeling to go away eventually, but it didn't. So I asked myself, I said, wow, how long is this going to last, this feeling of this piece? Because it was incredible. I, you know, I could have stayed there all the, you know, my, the rest of my life. It was incredible. And when I asked that question in my mind, how long is this going to last? Then my consciousness just shot out like a bullet through this, I guess, almost like a cosmic tunnel, uh, like colors going by and almost like at the speed of light. And I was just moving and it, it felt like I could just go and go and go for eternity. Like there was nothing impeding my movement at all. And it's almost like I was experiencing eternity. So I asked that question, how long is this going to last? And it was answered, eternity. And um, when you're, when I was moving at like, the, I'll say the speed of light, I don't know exactly how fast it was. Um, I got a little apprehensive because I didn't know where I was going. I was just moving and moving and moving rapidly. And, um, you know, when you go into a forest and go for a walk, you take a wrong turn, you start walking, you think you're kind of lost. And then you get a little thought, and you're like, maybe I should turn around and go back before I get really lost. Well, that's kind of what it felt like, because I didn't know where I was going. And so I thought in my mind, it's like, I should probably somehow stop and maybe get back to where I was. And as soon as I thought that, within an instant of a second, I was back in all those golden clouds again. And uh, just by thought, I was like, wow, that was quite the trip. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm floating there. I'm like, okay, well, what next? This is all an adventure. And, uh, you know, what's around the next corner? I don't know what's next for me. Um, at that, 30 seconds, maybe less of, feel, of just being there, um, that's when God showed up. And those golden clouds that were in front of me that I was in, uh, from the corner of my sight, bottom right-hand corner, it started getting brighter and brighter rapidly. And this intense white light just enveloped me, just came on like, like a rush and enveloped me and made all the clouds disappear and go away. And then I was in white again. But this white was different. It was intense love, radiant radiant love and it just it pierced every part of my being um and it was like the most beautiful feeling of love and like embracement love it was incredible um and i was like wow <laughs> and at that point that powerful love i knew it was god it had to be it had to be creator and god and you know, nothing else was that incredible and powerful that I've ever felt to experience before in my life. Um, I couldn't imagine it. And uh, and I, I felt that gravitational pull again. And they say, you know, go towards the light, whatever. Well, I didn't have a choice. Uh, I was being pulled towards the light. And, and I could feel myself pulling, being pulled and pulled closer to the light. And as I got closer to the light or to God, that incredible, intense love just kept building and building and building. Um, and before that, though, I kind of, I, I kind of pleaded a little bit. I didn't think I was done at that point. There might have been a chance. And it's, you know, you know, I was like, I can't, you know, I can't be dead yet. You know, I was only forty six years old, still young and young family and you know, maybe there's a chance I can get back. And and I couldn't talk. 
you don't have a mouth or anything. It's just telepathic. And uh, so it's just thought. And it's just like prayer. Um, so I was thinking, man, you know what? It can't be my time. It's like, a, I, only thing I had to throw out there is like, you know, the, I'm not even baptized yet. <laughs> and I was scheduled to be baptized the next month. Um, and it's like, I looked at, you know, it's next month is coming. And anyway, all the pleading, it didn't, it didn't seem to work. Um, what happened is the opposite. I actually got drawn closer to God even faster. The speed of me moving towards God increased. And that love increased. And it got to the point where I was just, I was, that's it. I, I, I'm done. I, I love it here. I love you, God. And, and I felt his embrace. I felt like kind of one with him in a way, um, like I was being held close. And it was, and I felt it was just God and myself in that moment. And it was a very, very, very special time. Um, and I felt his love for me. And I was ready to say, okay, take me. I'm, I'm going to stay. I'm going to go wherever you're taking me. Um, I'm done with life. This is too amazing. Your love for me is too incredible. Um, before I made that decision in my mind, though, I was heading that way. Um, God telepathically gave me a choice. And in my mind, there was a thought placed there. And it said, which way do you want to go? And I didn't think that. And, but it was there in my mind, in my consciousness, which way do you want to go? And it kind of threw me off a little bit because it was a thought that I wasn't even thinking about having. And I stopped and I said, wait a minute. And I said, did I think that or was that a question? Or did somebody ask me that question? And when I was questioning myself, God interrupted my thoughts by saying, which way do you want to go? And a thought interrupting a thought was just beyond me. I'm like, okay, that's God asking me a question. <laughs> I better not have him ask a third question, a third time. <laughs> so I said, this is serious. He's giving me a choice. And I was still thinking about going because it was so beautiful and the love was so great. But before I, again, before I made my decision, um, God showed me my girls. And it was almost like a movie screen or came up in front of me, kind of opened up in front of me. And, uh, excuse me. Um, and he showed me my daughters in the hospital, in the room that they're waiting next to where I had passed. And I could see my one daughter sitting in a chair and looking worried. And my other daughter uh, was there on the phone. She was talking to somebody or communicating with somebody. And I could tell that they were worried. And, and at that point, I was like, wow, you know what? I can't leave them. Um, so I, uh, that God helped me make my choice. And at that point, all I could do was, was pray and because I couldn't speak <laughs> with lips, but I just kind of settled myself and in this bliss of love, love. And I just, I just prayed. I said, you know what, if, if it's my time and if you really need me, then I'm willing to go. But if it's not my time and if you don't really need me, I need to be with my girls. They need me and I need to be with them. And as soon as I finished the word them, and that was final, it was like quick for the snap of the fingers. My eyes opened and I was back in the hospital um, in the examination room. And the very first thing I felt was my heart beating. And it was normal. It was a normal rhythm. And that immediately put me at ease. Like, okay, I'm back. My nor I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be okay. Um, I then turned and I looked towards the end of my bed and there was a one nurse there and I kind of sat up, I waved her, I went, oh, no. <laughs> and she just jumped out of her skin. Um, 
I startled her and um, she got this big smile on her face and went hola and then she started waving for people to come in the room. Uh, when I got back, I realized that all the doctors and all the nurses except for that one nurse had left the room. The lights were turned off, it was darkened and there was a metal grenade beside my bed. And um, and it was later, like I think I arrived at the hospital at 3.30 in the afternoon. And when I came back to my body, it was, uh, it was dusk. The, the sun was settling and it was dark in the room, the darker in the room, like a shade of dark gray. Um, there were no blinds in the windows. So I had been gone for quite some time. Um, and yeah, then I was back and in the ICU uh, for a number of days afterwards. And uh, it was an incredible experience. And I just want to let people know that, you know, um, the death, my death, it wasn't painful. Um, I couldn't feel anything at the time. My, and um, also I looked at my medical records after and those bubbles in my mouth that I had explained it because I was in I was seizuring and I did not know it. I was turning blue and seizuring and convulsing. And meanwhile, I was in this beautiful, calm, white space. And I guess, you know, on the exterior, physically, I don't know how it was breaking loose. <laughs> so, um, you know, the death, and then what I felt was, even though it was scary at the time, it was, um, you know, painless. And um, I guess it was a comforting situation <laughs> for me, you know, in the long run, it was very peaceful. Um, yeah, and I was already outside and separated from my body when everybody probably thought I was suffering. Um, so I was already gone. I wasn't in my body anymore. Um, separated from it. So that's another thing, maybe, you know, a nice takeaway is that, you know, even though somebody might be suffering, they might already not be there. Um, it could be comforting. Aaron, thank you for sharing your experience with us. Is there any indication in your records for how long you were dead for? Nothing in the records. I do have the time that I entered the hospital which was in the, the time on the EKG, which was 3.30 in the afternoon. And I don't know, but it was it was dusk outside. And by the time I went down into the triage and they did another ultrasound of my heart and then got me in the ICU, um, by the time I, my daughters visited me, it was midnight. But it only seemed like a few hours to me. So I, uh, there was no time. But I knew it was quite a bit of time that had passed. Uh, it was bright, sunny, you know, 3.30 in the afternoon. And when I got back, you know, it was dusk. So I, I don't, I really don't know. There's no indication. And they didn't tell me anything about my experience and what had happened, except for the, a brief medical report. But uh, yeah, it's something that I wrapped through my brain, I try to go step by step and I time it on a, on a watch and I go through my story and, you know, I can probably get through the whole timeline of events probably about seven or eight minutes, I would think, 12, 15, somewhere in there. I don't know exactly, but yeah, it's, it's hard to, hard to pinpoint, but it was enough time that, uh, you know, the sun, sun had started to, to set. Did you ever tell your wife that you were sitting next to her in the car while she was driving? And if so, oh, what was her comment? She didn't have a comment. She was like, wow, that's interesting, <laughs> you know. Um, but there was nothing said between us. I mean, it was just like a vision and a knowing, just a realization and a knowing. You know, I had to visit her, I guess, and it's almost like a a farewell or a goodbye or a closure, I guess, on things. Um, so the earth disappearing was a closure, like it was gone and gone from my life and I was moving on. Um, that, you know, that's also part of the piece too, that that, that chapter kind of closes on your life when, at that point. And I didn't think about earth after that in my life on earth. 
until I was shown my daughters. But at least your wife was driving, so that was somewhat verifiable? Yeah, it's, it's a route that, you know, she drives regularly, that we drive regularly, just you know, not too far from our house. And, um, and, you know, she drives all the time, so I couldn't pinpoint an exact time, but, um, you know, she doesn't sit at home very often. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, I, haven't, I didn't verify that with her because I didn't know exactly what time it was, that, you know, when this all happened. Did you at any point on the other side feel like you were at home? Oh, yeah, it was comfortable. It was like super comfortable. I felt at such peace there and it was so natural. Um, coming back was was difficult. Uh, being back here in this body, in our bodies and our vessels, it's, it's difficult. It's, there's a heaviness to it. Uh, there's it's a restriction. Um, um, it's just a shell. When you're out of that shell, you have such freedom. And and um, I really do miss that part of it. And that, that's a hard part of it coming back from a near death experience is that you're put back into the shell. That's um, and you know that it's it's not really you. <laughs> You know, visually, yeah, it's you, but, um, you know, your soul inside is, is something separate and different and continues on, and there's such freedom to it. You mentioned when the earth left, there was kind of like closure on this life. Mm -hmm. Did you feel relieved that, like, oh, this earth experience is over with? Yes, that's part of the piece. When I was, just before I shot out, you know, my consciousness shot out into eternity, um, that's what I was thinking. You know, there was no, no work, no shopping, no money, no stress, you know, all, all that kind of stuff was completely gone and it, you know, ceased to exist. And, and it was something of the past. And that's also what kind of created the peace as well, that feeling of peace. Um, you know, no responsibilities, nothing nagging on you. Work-wise, family-wise, job-wise, financially, all that kind of stuff, it's all gone. It just didn't, you know, in that space, you know, it didn't matter anymore. Since you've been back, have you been able to connect with God in any way? If you're talking like medium kind of stuff, clairvoyance, all that kind of stuff, not so much, but I do have a really strong awareness of God's presence with me. The God, no, like, you know, the Holy Spirit, I guess, um, that aspect of God with me. I also have become more empathetic uh, towards people in their lives and, and what's going on. Um, I have, I just have a really closeness. We're at the point where I can feel that presence of God, that same presence of, of that radiant love. I can sometimes feel that here as well. It, it's, it's obtainable. Um, and transitioning from my body to that spiritual realm, it was, it's almost, you know, it, it was immediate. Um, it's almost like it was another dimension that, uh, just kind of crossed over and it's, you know, heaven and god is not that far away it's it's almost like it's just another dimension close to us that's how i feel now and um yeah there, there's a definitely a, a closeness to it and also there's there's also some spiritual stuff after i got back hmm. um which made that even more prevalent and after i got back and i had surgery uh, for my heart condition um, and I was recovering and at, at home, I actually experienced, uh, in, in the dream state, that other dimension. And, uh, there was an, I don't want to scare anybody, but there was an evilness to it at the same time. I think that, um, there was an evilness that didn't like me knowing what I knew, the reality of God's love. And um, so I, I, I experienced some attacks, spiritual attacks, 
and it was scary and, it, and I guess you could feel physical pain in my dreams of being attacked and all I could do is, is, is at that point was I called on Jesus and it, I knew it wasn't normal and Jesus did show up in my, my dream and as a bright incredible white light and descended down in um, to where I was and just exploded in white light and woke me up and I was quite shaken. And that happened, you know, that happened a couple of times. And uh, right after I got back, um, I felt I was spiritually attacked for experiencing being that close to God and knowing what I knew. Um, since then, I, I, you know, I, I feel very protected and I haven't had that again. Um, prayed about it. And, uh, you know, it's a scary thought, but at the same time, you know, spiritual <laughs> spiritual realm is, is closer than you think and that and uh but now I, you know i feel very safe do you fear death at all no i don't it was a beautiful place to go uh what i do fear is leaving my family um and the hurt that it might cause them and that's that's what i fear is is uh you know, I guess hurting others and have, seeing other people sad and upset and, and leaving them in a position, of, you know, unfavorable, unfavorable position of me not being here. But the act of actual, like, dying and passing and moving on, no. But I, I think that's, you know, that's selfish. I kind of want to be here for my family. Um, I do crave that god experience and i miss it but i do know that you know i do have to be here for my family and uh and that's priority for me what was interesting is that in the moment that i was with god and almost ready to succumb and say that's it i'm going with you i you know i wasn't thinking about my family at that time because i kind of Figured I, you know, I'm dead. I'm done. There's nothing they can do or I can do about it. But what was interesting is that God knew about my family, and He knew what was going on. I say He, you know, there was it was He or She or whatever. It was just you know God. God knew what was going on, and I see God as a father figure personally. But um, so even though I was there with Him, He was thinking about my family and what they were going through. And, you know, that, that showed me how much he cares for my family as well. And it wasn't just about me. Um, you know, it was about me being back here and, and being with them. So that, you know, that father figure was, you know, envious. You know, I was here, here God was thinking about my family in that moment. And I, I necessarily wasn't at that time. You know, I struggled with that quite a bit too. But... Uh, you know, he was in control. God knew what exactly what was going on, knew exactly what needed to be done and um, and took care of it like, with a snap of the fingers, <laughs> you know. Um, I also felt in the presence of God, I didn't feel any judgment, just acceptance and love, um, which was which was <laughs> interesting and nice and beautiful. But I felt the authority of God. Like I was, I was useless. I was just this spirit, this soul, like tumbling around, not knowing what to do. I was like an infant there. I'd never been there before. I didn't know what was going to happen next. I was at God's mercy of what was going to happen next with my life. And God was in such control and had such authority there as well over the whole situation. I felt really cared for and looked after. And, um, and uh, that was very special, it's a very special moment. And, you know, the care for me, but the care for my family too. Um, so he was all encompassing over the whole situation. And uh, yeah, I felt cared for and looked after. What inspires you about your near-death experience? Just the fact that I was fully conscious. I didn't lose consciousness once for the whole thing. And I felt peace and love, and the transition was 
quite beautiful. Um, hopefully, my testimony can help others. Um, cope with death, earthly dying, <laughs> and um, you know, the fact that I was able to describe my death and conscious through it, it and that it wasn't a scary thing per se. And there is love and life in at the other on the other side. That's inspiring to me to tell my story to you know to have that for other people. Do you feel that you experienced eternity? Uh yeah, when I shot out my consciousness. Because I felt like I could just go forever un unimpeded. Like, you know, um and that forever feeling, you know, it's 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 something else. It's something I I hadn't experienced before, and where you can just move freely and not unimpeded. That that was like eternity. Like I could have just kept going and going and going and going, and um, and it's just by thought that I could control where I was, like you know, being a little bit apprehensive about how far I was traveling and where I was going to, split second and back up where I was. You know, it was it was <laughs> bizarre, um, but uh, definitely interesting and different. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would I would describe that as as eternity, in a way. Um, I mean, how do you experience eternity other than living in eternity forever? But that I felt like I could just go forever, unimpeded. If you had a friend that was suffering over the loss of a loved one, what kind of advice would you give? Oh, wow. That's quite the question. <laughs> um, I would just say, look, you know what? It's, they're in a better place and it's, it's peaceful. And if they're suffering, you know, whoever passed if, you know, on earth, if they were suffering, then they're in a better place. And if so, and I would just try to comfort them with my story. Um, you know, I've got some medical records to prove it. Um, have that sincere reality of my testimony hit them, and hopefully, you know, it'll spark something in them that you know there is something beyond this. Um, the doctors, when I got back, looked at my rec medical records, and they said. You know, you shouldn't be here. And if you were my patient, I would give you 0% chance of living, even if you're in my care. And when I heard that, that was actually the first time I cried. Because that validated, you know, what I went through and what I experienced. And uh, so to have that, to have that testimony and be able to passionately, you know, tell people about my experience and... Um, perhaps help them or make them aware that, you know, it's something that they should look into further and, and be a comfort that, you know, their loved ones or whatever are actually being taken care of and, and alive and well, even more alive than here. And um, I felt more alive there than here. And it felt more real than here. Does that mean to you that this is a dream? I wouldn't call it a dream. I'd call it a temporary experience. <laughs> so um, I wouldn't call it a dream. I think this is real. This is something that we have to go through. Um, almost, I don't know, I wouldn't say I mandated as a soul to go through this experience. Um, but it's only a short, I feel it's only a very short period of time. Um, short term pain for long-term gain per se, you know, to say. Since it's less real than the other side, could you consider it to be filtered? It is what it is. Um, I don't think purposely filtered. I've, I don't know what I mean by filtered, but subdued, I would say. Um, very limiting. We're very limited here. Um, you know, we're in matter. And uh, and there, there is no matter, it's spiritual. And so there's so much freedom. Uh, here, 
it's, you know, the world is heavy. Um, bodies are heavy. Gravity's got a pull to it. And it's not nice, <laughs> you know. Um, there's a heaviness here. And um, I think there's a definite struggle here. Um, and so I think there's, yeah, it, it's, I don't know if it filtered though. I think it's, uh, there, there's a purpose. Um, and it is what it is. But uh, this is our reality in this moment. And it passes though, this reality and into and progresses into something else spiritual. Well, you have a book that you wrote about your experience called The Return. If people would like to find more about it, do they find it on Amazon? It's been released through Amazon Global. Uh, it was just released recently. Um, so all on your Amazon platforms. It's available in um, yeah, paperback and Kindle ebook. And it's coming up to Ingram Spark, Barnes and Nobles, and everything, all those other distributors as well, through uh, the UK, Europe, and Australia. So uh, it's about a 200 page book. I uh, spent, I guess, it took about five years before I released it. Um, you know, it didn't take me a full five years to write, but, right. you know, it was hard writing it. Because every time I wrote it and edited it and went over it, I was like reliving it and, uh, you know, the good and the bad. Um, and I'm, oh, well, I'll be first to admit I'm, I'm not a writer, but I have a really good story. And uh, I had good editors. So, <laughs> But yeah, it's it's available and it's, it's there for people who want to read it and share it and, um, you know, dive into a little bit more of my experience. And it's, you know, it's about the experience itself, but also the return and my time back as well and what I went through and what my family went through. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? And if so, how do they reach you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm open to that. Um, as a matter of how, <laughs> social media, um, a lot of you know, I'm on social media as well, Instagram and Facebook and that. Um, yeah, if people want to reach out, I might start a page, an Instagram page or something specific to the book or a Facebook page specific to the book. So if people want to reach out, ask questions, absolutely. I mean, that's why I'm done doing this is to get the word out that, you know, there is life after death. It's not as scary as what it seems. Um, it can be comforting. Um, and, you know, the process of dying also was kind of easy <laughs> and looked after and, and it was peaceful. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Positive message is that there is life after death. Um, there is a creator and you will not feel alone. You will feel peace and you will be in God's love as well. God is love. And you will be looked after. And you don't need to know what your next move is. It's taken care of. I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know what to expect. But I felt taken care of the whole way. And um, I didn't even know how to move. I didn't know how to look around. And I was like a child. I was like a baby again. <laughs> you know, I was very limited. But I was taken care of. And... Um, and and put through a beautiful process. And ultimately it was about relationships and family and responsibility and I was returned. Aaron, thank you for your message and thank oh. you for being my guest. Well, thank you as well. Thank you for your questions and allowing me to, to be on your podcast. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.